I don't know when I'm repeating, when I have already said something and I'm saying it again or not because I'm running two different tasks at the same time and we, I, I tend to repeat. Some people, uh, at least the two guys will uh, hear maybe twice. But, uh, so, so the point is today I want to talk about tensor products of Hilbert space. And this is something that uh, I don't know all of you know, but I, I just want to uh, say it in the uh, in, a, in, a certain, in, a, in a sort in a sort of categorical way. Uh, have I discussed categories at all in this uh, course? Huh? Okay, so a, cate a category is like uh, like studying some some structure. Uh, you have, for example, you have a, a, you have, you have studied uh, uh, you have studied sets or groups or topological spaces or rings or Hilbert spaces or modules or whatever. So in all this, this you're studying some structure basically. You would think of it as a set with some kind of structure, although it's not quite accurate because some things aren't quite sets, it's like the set of all sets kind of thing. So, so Anyway, a category consists of two things, uh, uh, C, script C, and A. So th this has uh, some two things called objects and morphisms. So for example, uh, you might look at sets. And morphisms means uh, they're like mapping between the objects of the category which preserve whatever structure at all more. Here there are no structure, just sets. So sets with functions as morphisms. Right? Or you have groups and, and home morphisms. or you may look at topological spaces and continuous maps. So, so, what, uh, so what, what all this says is, so, uh, so you have a collection of objects there's some, some, some collection so it may be very large, like I can't talk, I can't call it a set because, for example, in the first category, this all the objects of C are all possible sets, and you know that the, when you start saying things like set of all sets, you can run into logical inconsistencies. So, so it, it is some some collect, collect some large collection, uh, and. What, what are morphisms? So, for, for any x, y in C, in O, in O, C, by this I mean any two objects in that collection, in the objects of the category, one has associated something called harm of x, y. which is the collection of all morphisms this is a, uh, the collection of all morph and an object of this is called a morphism from x to y okay. and one demands two things only of the whole thing the structure is 
on demand that you can compose two morphisms and again get a morphism. Right? Uh, so, if you have x, y, z, you have three objects. Then you have a map from harm x, y cross harm y, z. to form ways, which you will denote by f comma g going to g circle f. Hmm? And the other thing is, your demand is that there exists something called for, for each x for each object x, there exists something called the identity of x as a morphism from x to x. Such that i dx circle f equals f and uh, g circle index equals g, whenever that makes sense. Here f is a morphism from x to some, from somewhere to x. Here g is a morphism from x to somewhere. Okay, the, that is all a category. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, associated with uh, uh, the, the system required to be associative. So F maps from X to X. Huh? F has to map from X to X. No, 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 no. Then I am to X. I have... Uh, for associativity. No, no, last one is last line. F must land on, land in X. Uh, somebody to X and here G is from X to somebody. And here uh, associativity means you might have an X or Z W. We have, so you have three, you have three maps, three morphisms and if you compose them in pairs and do it the right way, you'll get the same thing. Okay. Uh, and there is a natural notion of two uh, objects being equivalent. So we say that if, if, uh, objects x, y are equivalent written x if uh, you can fill in the blanks. What can that mean? There is a uh, no bijective morphism is not a function. There exists a morphism G. There exists F in arm X way. Okay, now fill in the blanks. And G in harm Y Z Y X such that F circle G is equal to identity of Y and G circle F is IDX. Uh, 
so I, I quickly want to uh, stress this fact that morphisms need not be functions, depending on the category you look at. And I'll give examples to show why it is important to be able to look at such categories. Where morphisms aren't just functions, it can be very complicated objects. Uh, okay, well, for, for example, I can define a category by saying a fixed uh, topological space X. And I'll define a category by saying uh, maybe it depends on objects to be an element of orb CX is a collection of the form FA continues. That means Y is a topological space. Y A is a topological space, so in FA the continuous map from X to Y A. Okay. Okay. Uh, one often calls this category theory as uh, arrow theory or general nonsense for reason that I I will, I will try to convince you of. So uh, so, so what is the what is harm? So, so let me just rather than writing all this, I just said uh, this is equal to f a a family of functions f a with domain x. Once you say a function, that means that function has a domain and co-domain. And so these are continuous functions, these are continuous functions with domain X and range anywhere, I don't care where they are. And if I, if I want, I will specify why I as a co-domain. Okay, then I want to tell you what harm F A G A is. In all this, I is also fixed. And uh, collect some set I. Some index set I. That also is fixed. So I will be thinking of I as 1, 2, 3. So then I will be looking at this an object here is a collection of three functions from X to somewhere. So what would I mean by this? So I will say so I will say it is the set of all such uh, pictures see. F A by definition is goes from X to some Y A. Whereas G A by definition goes from X to some Z A. Okay. So if I've given F A and G A, I want to tell you what the morphisms are. Right? So morphisms will be collections. Uh, HA, where HA are functions from YA to ZA in such a way that the, the, the diagram commutes. And a, a morphism from this collection to this collection is a collection HI of maps such that for every I, GI equal to HI composed with F. Is 
So I'm, I'm saying this is a category, you know. I'm just saying it is a collection of all such things. If there exists no such HA, then the morphism set is, is, is empty from, is from this to this. There will be no morphism from this to this. For example, in the category of topological spaces, if we take X to be the unit interval and Y to be, uh, no, I can't say that, uh, zero, there may, there may be categories where there are some pairs of objects for which the home set is empty. Nobody demands that that, that is non empty. Home from X to Y can be empty. For example, you're talking about groups and homomorphisms, right? There are, you can certainly you can come up with a pair of groups. So that there is no homomorphism from this group to this group, right? Yeah. Hmm. No, no, this is not true. You can always the trivial, <laughs> trivial one. So, but anyway, you think about a, an example where there is no morphism between some pair. Okay. This one. Okay, there, this is this, this is probably not a good example. I, I should have. I want I wanted to think of the product example, but I gave the wrong thing. So what is a Yeah. Okay, so uh, let me make a definition. I'll come back to that example. That is the, uh, the example I want. I will say that an object uh, uh, X is a Universal initial object if arm X way. is a singleton for all objects by for any way there's only one morphism from X to that. Then for example uh, 
Okay. And similarly, you call it a universal final object. If, what do you think is it? No, I will call it a universal final object. Final is here. If how should you the definition? Y X is huh. So I will change this to harm Y X. The singleton for all for all Y. Hmm? So let me, let me make sure that I Yeah. So in the in the category of sets. See, a category may or may not have universal initial or final objects. I'm saying, but in the category of sets, I claim there is a universal final object. What do you think that is? I'm claiming there is so there exists some set said so that no matter what set you give me, there is a unique function from that set into this target set. Huh? In set category? Yeah. Singleton? Singleton. Huh? Singleton set. Singleton set is a? Initial object. Initial? From a singleton to a five element set, how many functions can you get? Singleton is a final object. Singleton is a universal final object. Hmm? So such objects may or may not exist in a category. No, 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 it, ex it exists. So I'm saying the category of sets does have a universal final object. But is there a universal initial object? Can you find a set such that for every set there is a unique function from this set into that set, that set? <coughs> huh? Unless you think of the, the empty set as such a, by some kind of vacuous uh, nonsense you can but anyway, uh, but there are non-vacuous consequences of looking at such things. The, so the ma main, uh, the main fact I want to stress the following thing. Proposition. If a category. Sir, but if Y is then always In the, the home of x, y, singleton for all y, if you take y, sorry. that's what he said. So why is a singleton, is a, final singleton is a universal final object? As a target space that there is only one function into the singleton. But there are, I don't believe there is anything for which the unique function with that a domain into this thing, unless you think of that, uh, the empty set or something, nonsense. I would, I would, let's not get into that. I want to say if a category has a universal, let me just say universal object, initial or final. So I'm, I'm making two statements. If it has a universal initial object, then something. If it has universal final object, then something. Then I want to say that such an object is unique up to equivalence.
So if you know this theorem, then you will know that the only possible final object in the category of sets are singletons. Right? There is no other final object. So an initial object can be also an initial object is also equivalent to final object. No, no, no. I'm not saying. Two initial are equivalent. That's why I said there are two statements I'm making. If there is universal initial object, such an object, is, if if it if a universal initial object exists, it is unique up, up to equivalence. If universal final exists, then it is unique up to equivalence. And you see the proof why uh, 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 there are two very different kinds of animals, initial and final, as you already saw in the set theoretic context. Suppose X and, for example, suppose X and X prime. are uh, universal which you want, let's say a final object. Hmm? Then I say you look at X. This is universal final object. In place, in particular, the form of anybody to X is singleton. Maybe let's call this set G. That home set can consists of exactly one element. Similarly, if X prime is since the X prime is universal initial object, final object, form X X prime must also be a singleton, so let us call it F. Then I observe that if I look at harm x x, on the one hand I, I contain, I know it contains from x to x, I can first do f and then do g. This must be in harm x x. As also, because you're in a category, there's always the identity morphism for the object. Right? But X is a universal final object. So this set must be a singleton. Therefore, G circle F must be identity. Hmm. It was IDX. Exactly similarly, F circle G is I X prime. Right? So, in the, in the natural notion of isomorphism in your category, such objects, if you know, prove that they exist, they will be unique. Right? So, for example, let me, let me give you another instance. Let me go back to that, that uh, example that I gave you. I look at this. This category of maps from some set to YAs. Hmm? So, uh, 
So I want to say there is, a <coughs> there is a universal final object in this category. I should call it uh, CX. Uh, yeah. No, no, no. Uh, sorry. Uh, no, no. Let me, let me not call this. No, no. This, this was not, not this. This is the wrong. Sorry, I made the mistake. Let me start, start again. I'll, I'll choose a different thing. I have a collection of. Uh, A collection of uh, let's say let's say groups you can take topological spaces rings whatever you want hmm? okay so I want to say uh, I want to define a category based on this family YA whose objects are are pictures like that that I showed X to YA FA where X is topological space, uh, group or topological space or whatever. And Fi are the corresponding morphisms, homomorphisms or continuous. You can also do this with Borel spaces, not, to, not just topological spaces. Then I want to say, and I want to define morphisms here. So what is harm of uh, X, F, A, Y, A? X prime, F A prime, Y. And we have two such ob two objects in this category. I want to tell you what the morphisms are. So this is. So what do I have? I have X to Y A, X prime to Y A, this is what I'm giving. I want to find morphisms from there to here. So I say it is exactly all G from X to X prime, which are morphisms. Uh, let, me, let me just say in, in harm, harm X X prime. Either group home of some continuous map, but depending on whatever category you're talking about. It is just maps G such that this diagram commutes. For all I. Right? For all I F A prime circle G equal to F A. So 
so i want to say uh, G is not a composition. Uh, again, I'm not saying the right thing. Is it? I don't know one. Yeah. Let me see if I'm, I've got it right this time. So, so I want to say that if I take product y a, with the projection mappings. is a universal what object if I have function from final object in this category. That is if I have A map from maps f i from z to y a, there will be a unique map to the product space, product f i, such that if you do this product map composed with the projection, then you will get the initial map f i. Right? So, so in some sense, the, the the product of topological spaces, the definition that you usually give, is, is, is in, a, in, in some sense it is force. That is the only structure that topological space that you can have with the desired uh, universal properties that it has. The the product were topological structure or the product Borel structure, they, they're all uh, determined by the initial structure. Okay, so now let me get to the topic of why I'm saying all this uh, nonsense. So suppose now that I just take two spaces now. Suppose H and K are Hilbert spaces. And then I want to define a category C whose objects are a typical object of this will be a pair uh, what should I call it? M phi the objects are pairs like this where uh, 
एम इज अ हिलबर्ट स्पेस एंड फी इज अ मैपिंग फ्रॉम एच क्रॉस के टू एम no h cross k is not a vector space or anything so the they no where m is the hilbert space h cross k has no a priori structure at all so what one demands the phi is a bounded by linear form by linear function and you know what that means that means that phi is a function from h cross k to m bilinear means if you fix any one variable it is linear as a function of the other variable that makes sense if you fix one variable then it's a map between hilbert spaces so it is by it, it is bilinear functions Which are bounded. What does bounded mean? It means that norm of phi is a eta. There exists a constant less than equal to k norm z norm eta for all the eta. In fact, when you look at bilinear functions or sesquilinear functions, the small in for all k satisfying this is called the norm 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 of their bounded bilinear function. Right? One let us let us agree to say the norm of phi is in for f k. Such that this inequality holds. The smallest positive constant, and then this thing holds. Because you did the same by then, you can also say that this is equal to the sum of all norm phi the so. So here's another exercise for you to where z eta in the respective Hilbert spaces are unit vectors. This is exactly the way you prove for bounded bounded operator. If we take, if we have bounded operator, that means the the norm t is less than k norm z for some k. Then for all such k, what you call the norm of that operator. It is also the sum over the norm of t z over all unit vectors z. So exactly similar argument will say that this rule in the bilinear case. Okay, so now then. Get to. So I want to define the tensor product of Hilbert spaces now. That is where one is heading. So I want to define a category. Oh, I have defined the category. So here is the object. So, so theorem. This category has a universal. What are morphisms? Ah. Ah. So I should tell you what the what, what do you think the morphisms are? If I have 
phi m phi and some n c that means phi so you must think of everything in terms of picture, uh, arrows here the morphisms are bilinear maps from h cross k to m and in the other case it is bilinear maps from h cross k to n and you want to go from here to here what is the natural thing you can do it is exactly all those bounded operators from m to n which may make the diagram commute in b of mn So these are the morphisms. So I want to say that C has a universal initial object. And once I say it has a universal initial object, then I know it is unique up to isomorphism, right? Which I'll denote by H tensor K and I must tell you, for the object I must tell you a Hilbert space and a bilinear map. The, the bilinear map I will denote by psi eta going to I will just denote call it dot tensor dot. That is psi eta goes to psi tensor eta. That is, H tensor K will have will have elements that are called Z tensor eta for Z and eta in in H in H and K, and the map Z eta going to that that is there is a map by in the Z eta going to Z tensor eta in bilinear. Bounded by linear. <coughs> and okay, so we'll see properties of this of this mapping. So, so what does this theorem say? This says that you give me two Hilbert space H and K. I can give you another Hilbert space for H tensor K and a collection of vectors called which are denoted by Z tensor eta and that Hilbert space, which which behaves bilinearly with respect to Z and eta. In such a way that if you give me any bounded bilinear form from H cross K to any M, that will factor through the tensor product. That is the phi, uh, given any phi, what it says is for all phi, uh, for all m phi in the object, what we are saying is there exists a, a unique phi tilde in B of H tensor K M such that phi of zeta is phi tilde of z tensor eta. Right? That is exactly what this translates into. The universal universality property says exactly this. 
and we will see that in fact norm phi equal to norm phi tilde. Okay, so no, it's okay. It's okay. I'll get it. Thank you. Okay, so, so might as well tell you what the proof is. Uh, uh, coordinate is proof. So, in fact, it doesn't matter which way I, I give a proof. If I show that one such initial object exists, so I give one construction of something that can be called the tensor, tensor product, then that must be isomorphic to every tensor product. There is one canonical tensor product. That's what the universality property says. So, proof. Fix on orthonormal basis. E I I N I say and eta J J J for H and K respectively. Then I should tell you what the then I will I will uh, and by definition H tends to K Is by definition a Hilbert space with an orthonormal basis indexed by the set I cross J which I will denote by Xi A tensor eta J. Given any set, you can find a Hilbert space with that Hilbert space dimension with an orthonormal basis of that cardinality. You can take just little l2 of that, that index set. Right? You are not... Uh, given any set x, I want to say there is a Hilbert space with orthonormal basis indexed by x. What is the reverse space? I take L, little l2 of x, by which I mean functions from x into the complex number, which are square sum open. If x is uncountable, that means that this net of finite sums, if I take the square sum, that will be, that'll be sum open. So you can always choose the Hilbert space as this orthonormal basis. And I will declare that I will define Z tensor eta equals. This, this animal is supposed to be bilinear in Z and eta. So, on the one hand, I, I decompose Xi with respect to the orthonormal basis Xi. Xi, 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 Xi. And then eta, eta J. Xi, A, tensor eta J. Then, 
Why does this series make sense? If we have an orthonormal collection of vectors, in order for a series like this to make sense, it just must be norm square sum of them. But if you take the norm squared, there is just going to be mod squared of these. And that is the sum that, that will split as sum over a and sum over j, and those two things are summable. And so this uh, this makes sense as a vector in the Hilbert space h and k. And by definition, we see that norm of z in z and theta squared equals norm j squared, norm eta squared. Right. So, uh, actually, you can find, the, uh, you, can, you can use polarization, for example, or you can do direct. The same way, you can verify that if you take an inner product, z and theta, z prime and theta prime, that will be summation, and that will be z z prime eta eta prime Okay, I've got my linearity straight, I hope. I don't, I hope I haven't screwed up uh, linear and linearity and complex linearity, conjugate linearity, anyway. So, you can see, you can just write down the corresponding z prime, eta prime, and uh, then you just take the Fourier coefficients. It'll be this times this thing, the other thing, bar. And then you take that, the, the exactly the same way that, that someone split as a product of two things and the two pro, uh, uh, factors of the product will be the corresponding separate inner products. So, so I have given you a Hilbert space with an uh, So, what is clear is that xi eta going to xi times the eta is bilinear and bounded, it is a bounded bilinear form because this is a bounded bilinear form with norm 1, right? Xi eta going to xi times the eta is a bounded bilinear form. And so now I just need to show that if you give me any bounded bilinear form, phi from h cross k to m, I want to say that there exists a unique phi tilde from H tends K to M is a bounded operator, bounded linear in B of H tends K M such that phi tilde of Z tends eta is phi of Z eta. You define it on the uh, phi tilde on the orthonormal basis, xi a tends to eta j is determined by this equation. And because it's a bounded bilinear form, you'll you'll see that phi tilde for any xi tends to eta will will make sense. The boundedness of 
పీఠంలో ఓ ఫీ సారీ ఇంప్లై దర్ ఎగ్జిస్ట్ యునీక్ ఫీట్ల్డ్ సచ్ దాట్ ఫీట్ల్డ్ ఏట సరే ఇట్లా జే ఈక్వల్స్ ఫీ ఆఫ్ దైట్ దెర్ ఎగ్జిస్ట్ యునీక్ ఫీట్ల్డ్ ఇన్ B of H tensor Km. Right? The, the, all this is, is completely straightforward. They, you just have to look at the definitions and see what they say. And so, so we have proved the theorem the, of the existence of this tensor product. it is unique unique it is a unique uh, initial object in this category so what that would so we will have the following useful consequences so i want to say that if x belongs to b of h h prime and y belongs to b of k k prime there exists unique operator which will be denoted by x tensor y in b of h tensor k is tensor h prime tensor k prime such that x tensor y of z tensor theta equals x z tensor y theta that right. this is this is really trivial because you look at the bilinear map from h cross k to h prime tensor k prime defined by phi of xi eta equals x xi and sub y eta it is clear that this thing is, is bilinear because x and y are linear and that it is bounded because of the nature of the norm in h prime that's a k prime the in fact and it is bounded with norm phi it will be bounded by norm x norm y so the conclusion is there is a unique operator from h tensor k to h prime tensor k prime which will carry z tensor eta to x z tensor y eta that is the universal property that i give you this thing immediately and notice that uh, x tensor x1 tensor y1 times x2 tensor y2 there is whenever they make so they have h h prime h double prime 
I have a triple thing like this, so, so whenever you have something like this, it will be To check such a thing, you just check it on vectors of the form Z and Zeta. Because vectors of the form Z and Zeta are total in H tensor K. They, they, they contain an orthonormal basis. If on, on a total set the two bonded operators agree, then they will be the same everywhere. Right. So, so this is the check. So, in particular, so extensor eight k and y tensor eight h. Sorry, eight h tensor y. If you take the product of these two guys, you will get extensor y, no matter which way you take the product, the commute. With product equal to uh, extensor y. So I, I want to, uh, there will be some two special cases that will be uh, useful to look at. So I have used the language today already. So given any set X, or let me call it I, I any set any index set. Then I can I can talk about a Hilbert space with I as basis which is called L2 of I. So for example if, if I is equal to so I will write n to denote 1, 2, 3 n or a set with cardinality n, then L2i can be identified with Cn. If i is a positive number, is any countable, countably infinite set, L2i can be identified with the sequence space L2. Okay, so the proposition the following three are all different descriptions of the same object. I can take and H is some Hilbert space. So I want to take H tensor L two A. You would really think of I am interested only in the two cases but i is n or the, the positive integers. I am only interested in the separable case. So we are interested in this or when i is n when L2 n is just the usual N2. Because going outside separable Hilbert spaces is, is an artificial uh, generalization. And anything that you can do there can be done by if you know what you can do in the separable case. Okay, so, so I will only really be concerned with these two examples. But let me just state it in this language. So this I want to say is the same identifiable with L 
टू ऑफ आई टेकिंग वैल्यूज इन एज सो वॉट डू आई मीन बाई दिस आई मीन ऑल फंक्शन साई फ्रॉम आई इन टू एच सच दैट समेशन ओवर आई नॉम जई आई स्क्वेर इज फैन एट there i'm talking about h value del2 l2 sequences here i have an l2 sequence sensor h or, or take uh, this or i can think of this as the matrices of size i cross 1 here i i use an index set for indexing matrices you don't know of m, m of 3 cos 4 or some such thing but i'll talk about m of i cross j of meaning it is just set whose indices are indexed by rows are indexed by i and columns by j m i cross 1 that means column vectors Over index by h, h, or direct sum i and i, h a, where every h a is really uh, unitedly equivalent to h. When I say this tilde tilde tilde, I mean that there is a natural unitary from this space to that space. So if I have uni unitary from h i to h for all i, then there will be a natural way of identifying this infinite direct sum. All these four are, are distinguishable, are identifiable. I just have to tell you what they look like. So let me look at basis vectors and tell you what they look like. So what are basis vectors here? So for h, you I, see for l two i, this has natural basis uh, o and b. I will call it delta i. Think of it as Kronecker delta. I mean, uh, point mass at delta. Okay. So, uh, so the identifications are: you look at C tensor delta i. And we call it delta j. This vector here, I want to say, we go. We'll go to the function. What is the function over here that this will correspond to? I will tell you what it is of the function that sends the i to. Delta i j is i. The h tensor l two i I want to identify with h value del two i sequences. So if I take the the basis vector in l two i, z i tensor that vector I want to identify with. The vector here, which has a non-zero coordinate, only in the i-th coordinate, in the sorry, in the j, right in the sense of delta j, 
1.5 with the the h value l2 vector with only non zero entity in the jth spot where it is equal to say and this are identify with the, the column vector similarly z in j in spot j and zero elsewhere in the, in the in the third picture this is what will correspond to and in the fourth thing also the same thing in the jth spot it is i elsewhere it is zero and you can check that uh, all these identifications are norm preserving unitary they will map author orthonormal basis here will correspond to orthonormal basis here and here and here so that you have a unitary identification between these chaps. That norm psi i square less than infinity. How are identifying the second part? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, the, okay. By this I mean so I mean only those sequence xi i. Such that summation norms a squared is very. Good point. So we only look at such such things. So column when I say column vectors, I mean the the these L2 vectors. Because I want Hilbert space structure, so I, I look at only those. Okay, so, so is this all uh, straightforward and, and clear? Okay, so now I want to uh, Okay See, we know that any operator on direct sum hi will be given by an operator matrix and i cross i operator matrix where all the entries are operators on b of h. If we take h as equal to hi, I can identify this with all uh, Operators on this I can identify with uh, what I call as MI of H is the, those things for which that series converges, that uh, net con uh, no, the series converges, it's not a countably index series. Then the summation VI star XIJ, VJ or something that I wrote down last time. Only some matrices will correspond to bounded operators. Not every matrix will correspond to a bounded operator if the index is set is infinite. When it's infinite, you have to ensure you have convergence, so you have to be a little careful. Okay, so so the one final thing that one wants to do with this is uh, I just want you to observe the following thing. In uh, yeah, so, so let me just take the example of I equal to two. So I'm, I'm saying if I take A tensor C2, the theorem that I've just said can be thought of as this, 
or the matrices column vectors 2 cross 1 of h let, let me drop the, the second one for now the second description or h related to h Right. All, all these silver spaces are equivalent is what this, this proposition we just said. It says in this particular case. Okay. But so now we know that if I have an X in B of each tensor C2. We know that this corresponds to B of H and the C2 corresponds to M2 of B of H. That is, this X will correspond to uh, a matrix X11, X12. X21, X22. And the way this will act on H to rate some H is by matrix multiplication. You would think of H to rate some H as M2 cross 1 of H, which is just column vectors, and matrix multiply. Matrix multiply means an operator multiplying a vector means acting. Okay. Now I want to see. So, we, we've looked at uh, I, I always get screwed up with this. So, there, there are two special kinds of operators here. I, there is, I want to look at not just operators X, but I want to look at operators of the form A tensor B, where A is in B of H, and B is in B of C2. Right? Under these different, different avatars of the same object, B of C2 is identifiable with M2C. Okay, now A tensor B will, must correspond to, so rather than writing what an A tensor B itself looks at, looks like, this is after all equal to A tensor 1 times 1 tensor B. Where well, first one is the identity of C2 and the second one is the identity of H. So let, let us try understand what operators of these two types look in this in in these pictures. What will an A tensor one do to a right answer eta it gives us a right answer eta ok now what are these the x i j by definition on the other hand this I, I should be able to represent by a1 uh, suppose I'm just writing x11, x12, x21, x22. And let me take just the basis vectors now. Let me take z tensor 
delta i instead. Delta j is now the standard basis for C2. Then, what is z and delta j in this matrix form? form? If I think of it as m21 of uh, thing, then what is that? Z and delta, uh, delta 1 or delta 2. We do both of them separately. Let's do z and z delta 1. Suppose this is a tensor 1. Then let's see what a tensor 1 of z and z delta 1 is. What is it? It is this matrix acting on how do you write z and delta 1 as a column vector? Huh? Psi tends at delta 1. Delta 1 is 1, 0. Z tends at delta 1 is supposed to be in m2 cross 1 of h. It's a, it's a two size column vector with n d is coming from h. So what can z and the delta 1 possibly be? So this will correspond to this acting on z0. Okay. And in fact, uh, let me just say, if I take A tensor 1 of Z tensor delta J, against eta tensor delta i. What I will get will be a xi eta delta i j. Right. That means A tensor 1 of this thing is now go back to how these XIJs were defined. These XIJs Xi eta what is this? This by definition is taking A tensor 1, act putting it on, taking xi at the jth spot. See, this is by definition the same as this. When you write a matrix for an operator, what it does is it takes it. It, it does exactly uh, you you embed the j Hilbert space in the big Hilbert space. The j Hilbert space is just eight sitting in, in the, all the all the Hilbert spaces are eight. So j Hilbert space sitting in the big Hilbert space is eight sitting in the j spot and zero elsewhere. So you take xi in the j spot, 0 elsewhere, and hit it by this matrix, and then take inner broad with eta sitting in the i spot. 
and that will be exactly x i j psi eta. So what this says therefore is that x11 equals x22 equals a and x11 x12 equals x21 is 0. If you look at a tensor 1, so I'm saying in matrix form a tensor 1 is equal to a tensor 1 equals When you think of A tensor 1 as an operator on H tensor C2, which you identify with this direct sum and represent that as an operator matrix, the matrix you get will just be A stored along the diagonal with 0 elsewhere. And um, maybe so, so you think about so similarly I'm saying one tensor B so this is an exercise to, to make sure that you understand this identification please do this exercise one tensor B what is B B is an operator in B of C2 which is really M2 of C that means that B is actually a 2 by 2 ma matrix of complex numbers. Right? Now I must get an operator on H to direct some H. There is a 2 by 2 matrix whose op entries are operators on H. And the data I have is a 2 by 2 matrix of complex numbers. So you do the obvious thing you can do. B11 times the identity on H, B12 So when I read the scalars, I mean that multiple of the identity It is just B matrix thought of as <coughs> multiples of the identity <coughs> so this is A tensor 1 and this is 1 tensor B. So as, uh, before we, so next time we are going to start talking about von Neumann algebra seriously. So one of the first things you have to really get uh, comfortable with when you do that is this, this computation.